Son and to the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus, most high, you are without beginning or end, and you are beyond all our understanding. Your angel was sent to righteous Joseph to dispel his fear. Now confirm us in your truth and make us worthy of your salvation. Keep us from all doubt and protect our faith that we may profess your miraculous birth and honor your pure mother Mary and the righteous Joseph. We raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. Raise glory, honor, and praise to God the Father who sent his angel in a dream to righteous Joseph and to the glorious Son who dwelt in the womb of the pure Virgin and to the Holy Spirit who revealed the mystery of the Holy Virgin's conception. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast in all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. Glory be to you, O Christ our God, you chose the most blessed among women to be your mother. And in a dream you revealed the mystery of your conception to righteous Joseph to whom she was betrothed, filling him with all peace. Today we celebrate the feast of your divine revelation, the divine revelation that Joseph received dispelling his fear, the divine revelation that filled all believers with joy, the divine revelation that removed every doubt from Joseph regarding the purest of virgins, now, O Lord, we implore you through the prayers of Mary, your mother, and Joseph, your chosen one, and with the fragrance of this incense at the celebration of this feast be for our salvation. Sanctify sinners and dispel all doubt and fear. Bring back those who are far and protect those who are near. May joy and peace fill the entire world and love and unity dwell within our hearts. May the departed find rest in your heavenly kingdom and we raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever.
O Lord, you are the sweet fragrance who fills the entire world. You remove fear from Joseph's heart and confirm the truth about Mary's conception. Accept our incense, fill our souls with joy, and grant rest to all the departed, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, now and forever. Kaddishat Aloho Kaddishat Fear, son of David, said the angel in a dream, for the child Mary carries is the Son of God Most High. St. Paul to the Ephesians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and your children forever. Brothers and sisters, because of this, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if, as I suppose, you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for your benefit, namely, that the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly earlier. When you read this, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to human beings in other generations, as it is now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit that the Gentiles are co-heirs, members of the same body, and co-partners in the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this I became a minister by the gift of God's grace that was granted me in accord with this exercise of his power. To me, the very least of all the holy ones, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unscrutable riches of Christ and to bring to light for all what is the plan of the mystery. Hidden from ages past in God who created all things so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be known through the ch church and to the principalities and authorities 
in the heavens. This was according to the eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have boldness of speech and confidence of access through faith in him, so that you do not lose heart over my afflictions for you. This is your glory. Praise be to God always. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Saviour announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew, who proclaim life unto the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The Apostle Matthew writes, Now this is the manner of the birth of Jesus the Christ came about. When his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but before they came together in habitation, she was found with child through the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, since he was a righteous man, was yet unwilling to expose her to shame, had decided to separate from her quietly. Such was his intention when, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. And he said to him, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home. For it is indeed through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived within her. She shall bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he shall save his people from their sins. All this took place in order to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall name him Immanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph awoke, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took his wife into his home. He did not know her until she brought forth her firstborn son, and he named him Jesus. This is the truth, peace be with you.
Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen. Today, liturgically, we commemorate a crisis of religion. St. Joseph, this episode of this young man and the marriage to his wife is one that centers upon the virtue of religion. Not faith, but the virtue of religion. We don't often talk, we probably should, we priest. We should be talking about the virtue of religion more often than we do. Virtue, religion is a virtue, not a thing. We talk about religion as if it were one of these sects. We have Buddhism, we have Islam, we have Catholicism, we have Protestantism. So we speak about religion as being a thing, but that actually is relatively recent in the history of the world. It's only been since the time of the Protestant Revolution that we have used the word religion in that sense. And namely because fundamentally Calvin, Luther, they denied the religious state and therefore, they said everyone was religious. The thing itself is religion. But the word religion itself, St. Augustine brings up, and it's repeated by authorities throughout all the centuries. It's from the word religare, which means to be bound again, bound. It's why to this day when we speak about the nuns and the sisters and the monks, we call them religious. They are canonically religious. When you go to the monastery, you are entering religion. Though obviously you're, you're already baptized and chrismated, you're already Catholic. Religion, this idea of binding, that idea of the consecrated life, the religious life, flows from the virtue of religion. The virtue of religion is part of the virtue of justice, but we call it an imperfect part which we'll come back to in a moment. Justice is to render, the moral virtue of justice is to render to the other what is due. The virtue of religion is that strengthening, that power within the individual which orients them towards God in recognition of his being the origin of all existence, just quite simply. And so the virtue of religion is part of the virtue of justice, but it can never be repaid. You can't render to God. No one can render to God what is truly due to him. And therefore it's considered an imperfect virtue, not because it's bad, but imperfect meaning it can never accomplish what it truly justly needs to do. Therefore it is not perfectly justice, but is justice, is part of justice in the recognition of God as being the origin of all existence. Everything that I have, Everything that I am, everything that I have been, comes from God. The family I am born into, the time that I am born into, the talents, the qualities, the characteristics, everything that I have and everything that I am comes from God. The virtue of religion is the enlightenment of the individual to render that recognition to God. It is identified with the virtue, not identified, but it is associated with the gift of the Holy Spirit of piety. Piety is that virtue of recognizing origins. So the pi piety, for example, within a family is the recognition towards our parents. Of our, they are the ones through whom we are born into this world. But again, like the virtue of religion, the virtue of piety is also imperfect because we can never render what is truly due even to our parents for having brought us into this world. We cannot render justly the life through whom that we received through them. So the virtue of religion orients us towards reverence, the word reverence, to revere. I told someone the other day, I said, you know the title, reverend, you know what it actually means. Reverendus. It literally in Latin means the one who must be revered. That's what the title actually means. It's pretty awe-inspiring when you think about it. But reverendus is a, is a gerundive in, the Latin, in Latin. So it's not just revered as an adjective, but the one that must be. 
So reverence and the virtue of religion is this orientation of acknowledgement of dependence upon another, in this case, God. So it is a profoundly important virtue, moral virtue. It's not theological because it doesn't deal with God directly. Faith, hope, charity, these have directly God as their object. The object of the virtue of religion is reverence, awe. It's why we don't speak in the church. Why we put it in our protocols to say, please not to speak. Part of it was because, well, we've been in the midst of this pandemic, so don't stand around and chat in close proximity. That's true. But even when the protocols disappear, the house of God is the place where God reveals himself personally within the divine mysteries. And so we always keep that reverential silence because of the presence of the place. Even if I'm the only person in the church, well, if I'm the only person in the church, I'm chattering away to myself. There's probably other issues going on in my life. But the notion of the place itself, and of course, as an act of charity, it's also for those who wish to pray, I give them silence. But primarily from what we're considering today, this virtue of religion, it is the sense of the awe and the reverence of the divine altar, the place where heaven and earth join together. So that kind of aspect of treating the house of God with awe is an example of the virtue of religion. And when we treat it just as a meeting place or chit chat and all these things or an assembly hall, we're showing that we lack the virtue of religion or with that we don't recognize anything about this building at all. So when we come across, it's why even fairly recent history, you had a lot of families who taught the children, even when they drove by a church, they'd make a sign of the cross, not even being in the building, not even being at the altar, but this profound sense of reverence of this is the place where God speaks to us personally. Not just God's everywhere, of course, but God speaks to us personally here. And so the virtue of religion, as you can now understand, deals with what in the old law the first three commandments to honor the lord god not to use his name in vain to honor the sabbath to honor these sacred days the virtue of religion is associated with them so the virtue of religion is the fountain of our devotion it is what causes the devotion and it results in the spiritual joy joy is not a fe it's a feeling, it can be a feeling, but it's not necessarily always a feeling. It's not dancing around goofily. Joy is the possession of a good. So when I'm aware of my beloved friends at holidays or whatever, family, just being with them is joy. I'm not dancing around the table. Well, when you're a child, you do. But as you get older, you just have this sense of contentedness of being amongst the beloved amongst those who are close to you. That's joy. Joy is not, exuberance is a different thing. The virtue of religion is precisely the foundation uh, within that devotion of that spiritual joy which is based upon the contemplation of the goodness of God. The virtue of religion has a see the origin of all things, that everything I have, my bank account, my possessions, my intelligence, everything comes from God. And just even recognizing that already is a source of joy. It's not something that I created. It's something I have to develop. But the virtue of religion takes us deeper into that and brings about what is truly the joy of the presence of the goodness of God. And because we are both spirit and matter, or St. Paul says body, soul, and spirit, our virtue of religion necessarily brings into it also our physical action, how we act, how we think, how we emote. It is part of everything that we do. We're not angels. We don't just simply sit and sing pious hymns and think good thoughts and that's it, we're done worshiping. Worshiping is coming in and to find, and again, as I mentioned to you in our Semitic tradition, and we wouldn't have pews, you'd be coming in and that virtue of religion before the divine altar, the living altar, the one from which we receive all forgiveness where God reveals himself personally, it is face down to the ground, bums up in the air, and this adoration of this presence, that is the virtue of religion shown in its physicality. 
Just because the Muslims pray that way, don't think it's Islamic. They got it from the Christians. They found the Christians in that profound sense of adoration, entering the holy place, in that reverence, at the epiclesis, at the consecration. We spent a lot of our time with our foreheads to the ground. We only do it now on Good Friday, but it was that general gesture of the virtue of religion before the place where the Holy One reveals himself personally. So, why did we say this was a crisis of religion today that we're commemorating? When we understand this source of awe and reverence, the virtue, the moral virtue, and as a result, this is also the first of all the moral virtues, the highest of all the moral virtues is religion. That this crisis is of St. Joseph, not because St. Joseph, his doubt is about the through during, comes about because of the three months while he is alone in Nazareth. Remember in the Semitic, in the Hebrew way of doing things, your marriage was in two stages. Your betrothal, your marriage, you were already married. You didn't live together. You had two things that took place. One was the marriage. You negotiate dowries. She's going to get how many cows coming with her, what's going to be happening, what else is going to be brought. We have that in our sacred crowning. Our Maronite ceremony of matrimony begins with what actually was originally a unique ceremony earlier, not earlier in the day, but earlier in time calendrically, in which our ceremony still is supposed to have the blessing of some kind of garment that is given to the bride. It's part of the old days of the negotiation. So you'll notice the quotation I gave you at the beginning of the sermon today was when the angel says to Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home. Because the second part of the marriage was the party that would go on for days. So the first is the marriage, but they're already married. When we use, I'm explaining it because we use the word in translation of betrothed. And, and betrothed to us usually just means engaged, fiance, whatever. And they're not married, but they're actually married. Mary and Joseph are husband and wife. She has, they haven't had the party yet, and surely she would have said, all right, well, just wait. I'm going down to see Elizabeth, and I'll be back. Now, we are told in this first chapter of St. Matthew that she is found with child. Now, in those days, if a woman was to become pregnant between the, the marriage and the second part of the marriage of the party, nobody was shocked because they're married. They don't live together yet, but they're married. And it's clearly during those three months when she is in Judea that this young man that we are told explicitly by St. Matthew is righteous. He's, up, he's upstanding. It is the same term used describing St. Joseph as is describing Abraham in the Old Law, in the Old Testament. And it's precisely the, right, the reason why St. Matthew brings it up on his righteousness is because St. Joseph simply considers what this reality of his wife to bear God incarnate, to bring the Messiah into the world actually means. And let us think that if St. Joseph is about 20 and a pious man and an upright man and a holy man with this profound virtue of religion, He's now have 12 weeks to be thinking about what this actually means. Forget about walking into a church, forehead to the ground, rear up in the air, in adoration, prostrate before the divine altar. Think about the divine altar to be in your living room. The divine altar and the tabernacle to be in your kitchen, next to your dishwasher. In the middle of the family room, next to your television. How do you act now in that family room when the tabernacle is sitting in the middle of the room? Conversations may be a little different. Attitudes may be a little different. Actions may be quite a bit different. If all of a sudden the altar, the tabernacle, the blessed sacrament were present in my workshop, in the garage, in the basement, in my living room. And this is what Joseph is thinking about that the Lord God himself has chosen my wife to enter into this world, to have the tabernacle sitting on top of my workbench. How do you work then? What do you do 
when the awe-inspiring presence of the Divine One is with you. This is Joseph's crisis of religion. His crisis is not in disbelief. On the contrary, it's because he believes all of these things to be absolutely true. That we're told he can't do it. He cannot do this party when she returns. He cannot do this cohabitation. He cannot bring her into his house because the consideration in his virtue of religion, of understanding of what this means as he thinks about it week after week as he works and does his duty of state, he's overwhelmed. But it's not Mary's fault, which is why we're told St. Joseph considers then that it will do this discreetly. Again, we translate it by saying to divorce her. Divorce is anything but discreet in the modern English usage. So the term actually in the Greek is separate himself from her in private, secretly. Figuring out some way in which I don't have to do the second part of this and bring the Lord God into my home and into my workshop. This is what the crisis of faith is. It's not a crisis of believing. It's a crisis of the awe-inspiring aspect that I cannot do this part. And this is why the very first words, when he has decided that when she comes home, I'm going to talk to some of his other, her other relatives, we'll find another village, she'll be able to go there, and then God can do all the wonders of the work of redemption there and not in my house. And that's why he's decided to discreetly separate and do this quietly. And then we're told the angel appears to him in his dream and says to him, remember the first words. He is addressed as a descendant of King David, the messianic promises. That's a whole not, that was last night's sermon. And he says, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home. It is true this child is born of the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son. And you, Joseph, thou, you will name this child. This is the adoption of the son of David, of the Messiah. He is truly father. You will name this child. And then what you see in the quotation that the angel from, or St. Matthew in commenting on this, uses the quotation from the book of Isaiah, that a virgin shall conceive and shall bring forth a son, and he shall be called Emmanuel. St. Matthew tweaks the prophecy in the inspired text. And he adds that they will name him Emmanuel thereby encompassing Joseph, this upright, righteous, and religious young man, to be the one that you must name this child. It is your child, you are the father, you are the one who will bring him into your home. And this awe and this reverence that Joseph had was pushed forward and out of the way, and it's told as soon as he awakes from that dream, he goes about doing exactly that. So we can picture that what he does after this dream is to begin to arrange for the actual celebration. We will do this. It will overwhelm me all the days of my life to have this reality among me, but the Lord God has said, this is the presence and this is your task and this you will do. And that's why the gospel that we have read today finishes by saying, he named him Jesus. The Blessed Virgin is only spoken of indirectly through this whole first chapter of St. Matthew. So let us ask the Immaculate Virgin, honoring today Our Lady of Guadalupe on the 12th of December. Let us ask the Immaculate Virgin, the one of profound virtue of religion, and of the righteous, the chosen one. Now you understand why in our Maronite tradition we always refer to St. Joseph, the chosen one. He has a very unique and very special virtue of religion and task and vocation to be fulfilled in his life. He is the chosen one. May the two of them intercede before the divine majesty and obtain for each one of us an increase, profoundly increase, of the virtue of religion that we may stand in awe before the goodness of God and in reverence and in thanksgiving and that may he increase that profound joy 
to us when we have the awareness of that ever-present goodness of God that permeates every aspect of our lives. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
Almighty Lord, in God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings which your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Spiridion. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. in hypocrisy and united in a bond of love and peace through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ may we give one another the greeting of peace with the holy kiss we glorify and honor you your only son and your Holy Spirit who is good life-giving and consubstantial with you now and forever to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith that are pleasing to God.
merciful Lord, you dwell on high and look down upon the earth. Through the grace of your only Son, and you send your blessings upon those who bow before your holy altar. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. the Father, in your love for all people, you sent your Son into the world to bring the lost sheep back to you. Do not turn your holy face away from us as we celebrate this spiritual and bloodless sacrifice, relying on your mercy and through the grace of your only Son. We ask that this holy mystery instituted for our salvation not be for our condemnation. Rather, may it blot out all our sins, forgive our faults, and be an expression of our thanks for your goodness. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It is right and just to glorify you, bless you, praise you, and adore you, and give you thanks, O Maker of all things, visible and invisible. The highest heavens and all its powers praise you, the sun, the moon, and all the stars, the earth, the seas, and all that is in them, the heavenly Jerusalem, and the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. The angels, archangels, and all the heavenly hosts sing, praising your majestic glory with triumphant hymns, with never-ending voices and with sweet acclamations. They cry out and they proclaim. Wachlov Sagi, Mete Shadow, Mete Hub, 
قصون حومي وحوي رنق العالم علمين in memory of me for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim my death and profess my resurrection until I come again Remember your death, your resurrection, your ascension into heaven, your sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and your glory is second coming, when you shall judge the world with justice, and reward all people according to their deeds. Now we ask you, do not repay us according to our sins and transgressions, but in your compassion and love for all people, cleanse us of all our sins. We, your people and your inheritance, implore you and through you and with you, implore your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father. Have mercy on us. O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. For the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Anin Murio, Anin Murio, Anin Murio, Nite Moro Rojo Hayo Kodisho, Onachenda Lainu Al Kurbono. Descent, he may make this bread a life giving body, a saving body, a heavenly body, a body that redeems our souls and bodies, the body of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life for those who receive it. And make the mixture in this chalice, the blood of the new covenant, a life-giving blood, a saving blood, a heavenly blood, a blood that redeems our souls and bodies, the blood of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life for those who receive it. Amen. May these holy mysteries be for the sanctification of the souls and bodies of those who share in them, that they may excel in all good deeds. May they be for the strengthening of your holy church, which you founded upon the rock of faith, so that the gates of shale shall not prevail against her, delivering her from all heresies and doubts until the end of time and forever. Amen. We offer you, O Lord, this sacrifice for your holy church throughout the world and for the holy places that you have glorified by the presence of Christ your Son, especially for Zion, Jerusalem, mother of all the churches, Remember our pure bishops who spread the word of truth, especially our blessed fathers, Francis, the Pope of Rome, the Shadow Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the orders of the Church, and those who serve her. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember.
remember, O Lord, our parents and all our brothers and sisters, those who are here praying with us, those who are not here, and those we have asked, who have asked us to remember them in our prayers. Answer the petitions that will lead to their salvation. Remember those who have presented offerings upon your holy altar, those for whom they have been offered, those who have desired to make an offering but were unable, those whom we have remembered, and those whom we have not. Reward them with the joy of your salvation and accept their offering upon your heavenly altar. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, our civil leaders and clothe them in your fear, that they may stand for justice and establish peace. Remember also captives and prisoners, the sick, the suffering, and the afflicted, the needy, and those who labor in all walks of life. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O oh Lord, all those who have pleased you from the beginning, the holy and glorious ever-Virgin Mary, the patriarchs, prophets, and apostles, St. John the Forerunner, St. Stephen the Archdeacon and First Martyr, St. James the Brother of the Lord, St. Joseph, St. Marin, St. Spiridion, and all of the saints. In your grace, count us among them in the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the fathers and teachers who spread the word of truth in your holy church and preached your Son, Jesus Christ, to all nations. Through their prayers, grant peace to your church and confirm their teachings in our souls. We pray to you, O Lord. Mindful of God, O God, of all spiritual and earthly beings, of the faithful departed who have been died in the true faith, grant them rest and do not take their faults into account. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. And yes, O God, to Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. Christ, Father of mercies and God of all consolation. You have sanctified the offerings and the gifts presented to you and have perfected them by the grace of your only Son 
and by the descent of your Holy Spirit. Sanctify us, so that with pure hearts and enlightened souls we may call upon you, O Holy Father, God of heaven, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and Yes, O Lord our God, lead us not into temptation that we do not have the strength to endure. But when we are tempted, deliver us through Jesus Christ our Lord. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Shlomo elu kolichud. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of it, and receive the blessing of the Lord. O Lord, we bow our heads before you, awaiting your abundant mercy. Send your blessings upon us and sanctify us, so that we may become worthy to share in your holy mysteries with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and his mercy and love for all people. You are blessed and you are glorified with him and your Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. The grace of the most holy trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One holy Father, one holy Son, one holy Spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for the blood. O Lord our God, to you be glory
again we thank you, O Lord, and raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us.
We thank you, O oh God the Father, for your great and indescribable love for all people. Since you have made us worthy to share in your heavenly banquet and in your Holy Spirit, do not forsake us for having received your holy mysteries, but keep us in the radiance of holiness and righteousness. With the saints, may we obtain a share in the heavenly reward. Through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people, we glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, who is good, life-giving, and consubstantial with you, now and forever. Shlomo Elokulachun. Jesus, our Lord, protect us, bless us, protect us, and guide us on the path of life. Favor, we remember the departed of those who have shared in this Eucharist that was offered upon this divine altar. Grant protection to the living and bless them with hope through the prayers of the Virgin Mary and all the saints now and forever. Amen. There is a custom on the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe to take her message of Guadalupe in quotations. And so you have at the front underneath the icon of Our Lady, a tray that we have, that these quotations have been made in the bookmarks. And so for those who wish, the custom is, is that when you come, you draw one of the bookmarks on your way out of the church, and you have then a phrase, a citation of the message of the Mother of God at Guadalupe for your personal life to be meditated on, to consider, and to have the Mother of God speak to you personally today. So for those who wish, it will be at the Appleton Street exit, or you can come up. You're handing them out, or they're going to be up here? Okay. As you come up to leave, in front of the icon, make a small prayer, take one of the um, photo, one, take one of the bookmarks as you depart, and may Our Lady bless you throughout the next 12 months. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Amen.